Hello and welcome to Guiding Assets, the flagship investment podcast for CFA Institute. I'm Mike Wahlberg, and I'm excited to be joined today by someone that I'm sure will be able to help us all have more productive debates and make better decisions. Julia Dar is a managing director and partner at Boston Consulting Group. She founded and leads BCG's Behavioral Science Lab, as well as their behavioral science network, Be Smart. Now, many listeners may recognize her name and voice from her two TED Talks about effective communication, which, as of this morning, looks like it's racked up just over 9 million views. We're going to focus today on this topic of having productive disagreement, and in fact, using conflict as a starting point for improving decision-making. And whether that's in building better performing, better performing portfolios, or nurturing more resilient and deeper client relationships. So welcome, Julia, to Guiding Assets. Mike, I am so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. So, Julia, your first TED Talk was titled How to Disagree Productively and Find Common Ground. Now, that drew on your experience as a debate champion. And, and just as an aside for our listeners, that's one additional tidbit about Julia that I think has probably informed a lot of the work she's done at BCG. Julia was a three-time World Schools debate champion. Anyway, in that talk, you asked the audience to consider the merits of applying the principles of debate to everyday interactions. And in practice, that could be you know, avoiding shouting matches or worse at Thanksgiving or mudslinging to political debates or even Twitter trolls. So to start us off today, can you tell us what can we learn from the debate model about having conversations where folks are heard and actually listened to on the other side? It doesn't matter what type of conversations you find yourself in. So whether you're thinking about how you talk to a really challenging family member or a family member with very different views from your own, how you get together with someone to construct a portfolio, how you review a conversation or a meeting that might not have gone as well as you hoped. The skills of debate can be really useful in all of those settings. And probably you've all seen some version of a debate in your life. You might've been in one in high school for the countries you find yourself in. You may have seen it as part of a political campaign. But there are some really foundational lessons from the technique of debate, the idea that out loud, in public, we have an argument where we try to resolve differences that can be useful everywhere. So here are a couple. Number one, surprisingly to some people, might be the idea that we actually have to start from some kind of common ground. We have to say we're having a conversation about the type of world we want to have, the type of relationship that we want to have, the type of community that we want to live in. And of course, debates are disputes that happen out loud. So there's not a ton of common ground, but without any common ground, you can't begin to move forward and make progress. And Mike, I bet we can talk more about some specific techniques for being able to do that. But the second one, and the one where I think sometimes folks get a little bit tripped up, is the expectation that there should be development through conflict. So in debate, we call that idea rebuttal. And so rebuttal is the idea that you make a point and I respond, and then you respond to my response. That's literally the objective of the activity. And as human beings, that can be a really tough thing. Like it can feel like a bit of an assault on you, your beliefs, your value system when that happens. And so getting socialized to the idea that rebuttal is not only a normal thing, but it's actually how your ideas are going to get better and sharper is a really important lesson to take away from the world of debate. The third thing that I think happens to debaters but doesn't happen to, let's say, regular people is that we often get the chance to take multiple sides of an issue over the course of a career in debate. And so that, of course, opens you up to the idea that there really do exist alternative arguments, alternative points of view for a lot of the really challenging conversations in our world. And one of the gifts I think that that gives to us is what I talk about is the humility of uncertainty. So that's the idea that you might be wrong, but even more powerfully that it's, it's possible to change our minds, not only about what we believe, but really fundamentally who we are. And that, that shouldn't be a scary thing. That should be an exciting thing. I'd like to pull a little bit on that thread of the humility of uncertainty, because it, it certainly can play a role within our industry I'm thinking specifically in, in the analyst scrums that take place. So we spoke with Olivia Suboni back in May last year, and he, he talked a bit with us about 
behavioral biases and the ways that our minds can filter information in, in what can ultimately be a destructive way. So we're all human. We're all going to fall prey to one or more of these biases at points in our careers. And for, for those security analysts at those times, the dynamic that they have within their team becomes extremely important. They need their team to challenge them when they're wrong and they need to be able to hear it. So what strategies can analyst teams implement to give them the best chance at success? Well, I can tell you what they can do that will absolutely not give you the best chance of getting constructive challenge in your teams. And it's managers who say things like, just tell me if I'm wrong, or does anyone disagree? That is a recipe for a lot of silence and a lot of polite head nodding or awkward avoiding of eye contact. And I have some empathy for the managers in that situation. I think people think they're doing the right thing. They're trying to do what they've been coached to do, which is make space for it. But it's not very realistic if your boss or your boss's boss says, you know, just like tell me in front of everyone else if you think I am, if you think I'm wrong. Instead, you're going to get a lot of confirmation bias in that conversation. So what's the alternative? The only alternative that we've seen really systematically work is, not surprisingly, to have systems to do that, to actually normalize debate so that it doesn't rely on one courageous person raising their voice or raising their hand to speak up. Creating room and space on the agenda for the idea that we might be wrong and thinking about that really well. How do we do that? There are a couple of techniques. So number one um, is this idea of probabilistic thinking. So of course, in pitch meetings, in analyst scrums, we very often reward the idea of confidence and we accept that the assertiveness with which someone says something must be correlated with the degree of confidence that they have in the investment proposition. But what if we took that head on and instead started encouraging people um, to be probabilistic about their assessment? So to say I have a 70% um, degree of confidence in this, an 80% degree of confidence in this. And by the way, you actually see this in other domains relatively frequently. So for example, when the intelligence communities um, in countries around the world put together intelligence assessment, they will very often try to probability weight it to talk about how confident they are in the findings and in the recommendations in what itself, not unlike investing, is an evidence-led but highly uncertain field. So that's option number one, probabilistic thinking. The second option is actually just to assume that we are wrong. And so to invite someone else on the team to play the red team, the challenger, the devil's advocate, you can, you can call that role, whatever you like, but who is explicitly accountable for identifying all of the arguments against all of the weaknesses in the proposal. Sometimes I run into teams who say, oh, we do that already, or we expect everyone to do that on the team. And I say, okay, but like, does it happen that often? Sometimes in really healthy teams, it does, but in most teams, it rarely does until we make that someone's explicit responsibility. We said, this is your job um, to do inside, um, inside this particular meeting. You don't have to do it every week, but inside this particular meeting, this is the expectation that we have for you. Those are all pre-strategies. Even more important, if... You have an objective to say, well, we're building an analyst team that has a learning flywheel. And we are trying to get better and better, faster and faster all of the time is to do that retrospectively um, as well to say, well, what was the quality of the conversation that we had around this investment? And what was the judgment call that we ultimately made? And in retrospect, was that, uh, was that the right call? Was that a beneficial call? People will naturally say there are things we know in hindsight that we could not have known prospectively, of course, but there are also ways in which we could have interrogated the decision prospectively that in hindsight we can see that we did not do. All of that can lead you to much better checklists, much better mental models about how you actually make the decision. And some of the teams that I work with do exactly that. They start to systematize into a checklist. Have we done all of the pre-work? Have we considered all of the ways in which we could be wrong? And then retrospectively, did we look back at that decision 
and determine not only did we make that decision in a way that's consistent with the norms and rules that we've set for ourselves, but also, by the way, are we starting to build up a body of knowledge about whose judgment is highly trustworthy, highly credible over time, and who's in the room is less trustworthy, less credible over time. One of those principles that you see Ray Dalio write about all the time when he talks about trustworthy and credible decision-making in group context. Yeah, it's effectively creating accountability and forcing intellectual honesty in that environment. So when you look back, I mean, we obviously have systems in place to um, calculate attribution of value added on a portfolio, for example, but it allows you to separate skill from luck when you're looking back at it. Exactly. And skill and consistency and recognizing that there are you know, people, <laughs> some of your more conservative, more modest in their outlook, more modest in their probabilistic thinking peers over the long run are your consistent performers. It's in the kind of investment asset allocation world. One of those things that we also, we know we should do when we look at manager performance, analyst performance, but it's difficult to do without um, specifically disciplining ourselves to do so. So one thing we know about human nature, Julie, is we tend to be disproportionately averse to risk and even traders. So if they can have a terrible morning, feel the need to make it all back and then some just to shake that feeling of shame. And this can be a dangerous thing from a risk management perspective. So how can we help people when they experience those losses? How do we help them deal with that shame in a constructive way and then learn from it? You're exactly right, Mike. We, we should know that that's happening to all of us. We do tend to be risk averse. We tend to be loss averse. So afraid of losing what we have. And, and at BCG, we're doing some research right now on whether people are change averse. Are you willing, unwilling or unwilling to change course in order to you access some potential gain or even just to experience something different? And what we tend to find is that people are also change averse. Oh, well, if you know all of that about human beings, you say, well, how do we ever begin to make progress? How do we actually get to a rational set of decisions? Well, step number one is just acknowledging that truth about human beings, not denying that about yourself, saying probabilistically, that is true for me. There are exceptions, of course, but on average, we are not the exception. And so as I look around, my team, recognizing that this is a community that is likely risk averse, is likely loss averse, is likely change averse. That's kind of step number one, being humble about the limits of human decision making and building our own awareness about that. Because by the way, if you experience those aversions, imagine how clients feel when they come in for these conversations, when they want to review the portfolio with you. It's why on days the markets are down, your phones are ringing off the hook. And on days the markets are up, things are a little bit quieter. People are a bit less interested in talking to you, even as you've spoken to people about playing the long game. So that framing is actually something that, of course, happens in the client meetings that you, were, you mentioned earlier as well, right? This is It's a process of communication for client-facing portfolio managers to help sort of calm clients down when we're having tough years like we had last year. I mean, markets were weak and many funds, and I'm thinking particularly the tech heavy growth funds here, uh, those strategies were significantly behind their benchmarks. So you had sort of a, a double whammy of weak absolute returns, weak relative returns for some strategies. But those are hard meetings. So in those meetings, as you mentioned, clients tend to be you know upset and possibly combative. So what, what can those client facing portfolio managers do to make those meetings productive? Yeah, I bet they are. I mean, it's it's their money. Like no matter how painful you feel about the loss, I promise you, like those folks are feeling it even more painfully. Those are really stressful meetings too, of course. Sometimes as the person having that meeting, you are the decision maker, like you were the like executor or the architect of the portfolio, but very frequently, you're not, you're the person standing in between as a relationship manager, for instance, you're the person standing in between the client um, and the teams or the people who made the decision. So it can feel even 
an even less powerful position. What do you do in these really tense conversations? Well, there are a couple, couple of techniques that I think can be um, really valuable. The first one is actually just making space um, to listen and to hear people. It is actually just to say to people, I am listening. Like one of my objectives here today is just to listen to you. I'm not here to spin you. I'm not here to sell you something. I'm just here to listen to you and understand um, what you are hoping to achieve today. That can feel really awkward for some people. People say, oh, that feels too ambiguous for me to be able to sit in that kind of space. Julie Masters, who leads a program called Inside Influence, has a wonderful way um, of sharpening that up for people. And she says one of the really powerful things that you can do, and this is a debate technique, by the way, is right at the beginning of any kind of conversation to state your intentions. That can be at the beginning of a pitch, at the beginning of a negotiation, at the beginning of a client meeting, because it diffuses all of that uncertainty that we might be having about like, where is this going? What's Mike's angle? What's Julia's angle? And that can just be as simple as saying, my intention in today's conversation is to be able to listen to you it's to share some information with you about the current state of the market. And based on what I learned from you today, consider together how we architect your portfolio that meets your goals. That's how you do it in a client meeting, um, for instance. But think about different types of conversations. Imagine how diffusing it can be for people if you simply say, look, I'm going to start with you. My intention today um, is actually to get your business. And we don't know each other very well yet, Mike. And I don't expect you to trust me right out of the gate. And I'm here to share whatever would help you build confidence and trust in me. But that's, I wanted to be open about my starting point. Or you, my intention today is actually simply to get to know you a little bit better and to hear more about your goals. And if you're able to do that, if you're able to sharply state your intention, to clarify your own objectives, it's helpful for you, for sure, in terms of getting what you need out of the meeting. But even more importantly, it opens up a ton of space for the other person. Sometimes it can be re really freeing to hear, my intention is to get your business. People are like, oh, okay, like, that's what we're here for. There's no, I knew it. there's no messing around. There's not gonna be, exactly, there's no, there's no bait and switch um, that is coming. But it can be equally relieving for people to hear, my intention is just to get to know you. I'm a little bit better. This, is, this isn't a pitch. My intention is just to get to know you a little bit better. Think about that inside the context of a firm as well. If you were to say, our intention today is to challenge every single one of the positions over, let's say, $10 million that we've taken in the last year. And we are going to take a hard look at every single one of those and someone is going to present the case against and someone is going to present the case for. And we actually are here to be judgmental about ourselves. And that's a little bit different from the dynamic that you sometimes emerges where someone makes a hard pitch and other people say often too politely, well, like, may I, perhaps, obviously, I'm not the analyst on this consider raising an alternative point of view at which point you're like oh this meeting is basically like by the time you've asked permission to do so this meeting is basically over that's very different from being able and disciplined about declaring your intentions up front so i want to circle back just to this idea of these difficult meetings that folks are having because i feel like those are really fertile ground to either hit it out of the park in terms of building trust with your clients or the opposite of that. So I wonder what you can suggest around helping build trust with clients in situations like this. Absolutely. And tell me, Mike, from your experience and as you talk to people who come out of tough meetings, where do people think that they go awry? Is it people are upset and I wasn't skilled enough to diffuse the situation? Is it we had really competing objectives? Is it they, it was a very emotional meeting and I wasn't prepared for that. Where do they, where do they come unstuck? <laughs> well, obviously I've never been in a meeting that went badly, but... Uh... No, of course not. Obviously, <laughs> of course but not. you know, you've heard about other situations. I've heard about others, yeah. No, but <laughs> I, I would say that, the, yeah, the biggest fear among 
relationship managers, I think is, yeah, is looking unprepared is one thing, but I, I guess one thing I have seen a mistake made, and this is sitting on, you know, um, on the other side of the, as a client is having a portfolio manager, not admit a mistake or try to talk around, you not know, admit when they're wrong and, and try to sort of talk around an answer that they clearly didn't know the answer to. And that, that one to me always resonated as, you know, that's, that's a, that's a hit against trust for me because if you don't feel confident enough in yourself and in your team to be able to admit when you have mistakes and just maybe the systems inside your, your firm or your own skills aren't, aren't there. I think it's probably in almost every case, it's both instances happening. So we spoke earlier about this idea of loss aversion. And I think there's probably a lot of foolishness aversion that happens for all of us, particularly in a professional services context where people expect you to know the answer, expect you to have the answer, expect you in particularly, maybe especially in situations where people, where things have not gone as expected or not gone as projected to be able um, to respond really thoughtfully to those. Um, what do we do um, in those situations? I think first things first, we go back to exactly where we started um, our conversation today, which is reestablishing that common ground, reestablishing the basis um, of the relationship. Very often, not always, but very often, that will be about going back to the client's goals. So instead of defending your own decisions, instead of doing a deep postmortem on what went wrong, what went awry um, in a particular situation or with a particular investment. It's regrounding in the things that the two of you share. What's the shared hope, aspiration? What are the dreams that the client has or the expectations that the client has that you share? And I think once you can reground on that, and that takes some confidence, I agree, when you feel like you're on the back foot, but once you can reground on that, I think you've reminded everyone about the pre-existing relationship that is beyond this particular moment in time. So that's the first bit. What do you, what do you have to do? You have to get over your own foolishness aversion there of saying that this phone call is, is going to expose me. But Mike, you raised a second, I think, really, really important point of what do we do in a situation where we don't have all the information where people have really different points of view, really different assessments of the reality of a situation. I think the first one is saying like the foundations of trust depend on people not only believing in you as a person, but trusting in the rigor, the thoughtfulness, the care of your logic. And Francis Frey at Harvard Business School has a tremendous body of research on exactly this question of how trust is built and broken. And I think if we started by saying, I am going to go into this conversation with the hope that I can build, I'm here to build trust. I'm here not just not to lose trust, aversion once again, but I'm here to try and build trust. I think that would let us say, let me be empathetic and open as a person. Let me identify and describe the emotions that I think the person in front of me is experiencing anger, frustration, sadness, regret. And let me also have a conversation on a totally different plane, but at the same time around the logic um, of what should be done next, vis-a-vis -vis their shared goals. So that's listening to you, recognizing the emotions that people have. And I think sometimes there's a temptation to say, oh, it's going to be an emotional conversation that's gross like I don't, I don't really want to be in touch with your feelings i don't want you to touch my feelings i think people have to get over that um, and one of the ways to do that is to name the emotions that you're feeling name the emotions that you're identifying in the other person and it's only through that it's only the, the only way past that very emotional conversation is through i know some of you are hoping to avoid it to hopes there would be a way around it there's not the only way past is through and then I think the logical conversation comes into play. That means that where people have questions that you don't know the answer to, the best answer is, I don't know. That's the best three word answer. The best six word answer or the best seven word answer is, I don't know, but I will find out. I don't know, but I will find out. And it's being willing 
to tell people and be honest and humble with people about the limits of your expertise within the present moment. Um, and that willingness to say, I don't know, or I don't know, but I will find out, is in itself a very trust building ex activity. People worry that it's not credibility building. Maybe not, but it is trust building, provided that you then do indeed find out. Well, the time has just sped by today, Julia, unfortunately, and we're, we're just down to our final question here. So I wonder if you could please tell us what was your first job in the industry? And if you could go back and take yourself for coffee on your first day, what key piece of advice would you offer yourself? I loved this question. I have such a diverse array of answers from your previous guests. By the way, if you haven't listened to the back episodes, everyone, you, you should do it just for this question. My very first job, if we are to define the industry very broadly, I worked in the office of the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Infrastructure, same person, I'm the Honourable Bill English in New Zealand at the very start of my career. Um, so who, you know, the Minister of Finance, of course, has responsibility for stewarding um, the financial policy and the budget of the government of New Zealand. The thing that I would tell myself on that day is the same thing that I would tell myself now as you think about any new client engagement, any new conversation, any new opportunity um, with someone. And that is that it's not a job, it's an honor. And I think if you can approach even very tense conversations, even really difficult pitches, if you can meet constructive challenges by saying, like, it's not a job, it's an honor to be able to do this with you, for you, alongside you. I think suddenly the mindset that you might have about um, what you're willing to do, what you're able to do, how you're able to be of service might change completely. I've been speaking today with Julia Dar, Managing Director and Partner at Boston Consulting Group. I'm going to close out today with the final lines, Julia, if you'll permit me from your 2018 TED Talk, and spoiler alert for our listeners if you haven't heard it yet. At the end of that TED Talk, you invite the audience to stop talking and start listening, stop dismissing and start persuading, stop shutting down and start opening our minds. So thanks so much for sharing your insights today, Julia. It's been really a productive conversation and a real pleasure for me personally. It has been an honor. Thank you, Mike. I'm Mike Wahlberg, and this has been Guiding Assets. Mm -hmm.